drastically evolving. So when I was in university, when we wrote an essay, you know, we went to a building that was called a library. We climbed stairs. We pulled off a book from the library. We blew the dust off of it. And that was how we wrote our master's thesis, was a single book, right? This is not how we live now. We're constantly getting access to dynamic content. But this is not only in North America. There's an international phenomenon. Uh, not only is it an international phenomenon, it's also wrapped in big data and artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. So just for the sake of discussion, acknowledge that we as a society are in the midst of a massive sociological transformation. We don't socialize like we used to. A good example is that predominantly marriages in North America are happening ignited by apps more than they are like religious venues. It used to be you wanted to get married, you go to a prayer hall or a bar. <laughs> And that's just not the case, and, yeah, it's, and it's not the case anymore. You know, now more than half, more than half of all, more than half of all marriages in North America, no matter what religious designation, are happening because of app, and you know, app-connected parties. So I mention all this to you just to really put this in perspective. The last time, human, uh, you know, sociologists said humans have gone through a massive sociological evolution was actually in 1450, uh, when we invented the, the, when Guten, the Gutenberg Press was used to replicate doctrine and text and to share around the world. So our audiences, our customers, are like in the midst of an incredible transformation. And so that in itself should give us all pause. Like Nicole said earlier, like a little empathy here. Like back out and realize that the executive you're trying to sell these solutions to or the end consumer who you're trying to get to use your tools is just naturally going through such a sociological evolution that we owe them space, we owe them uh, uh, education and understanding rather than buy from me like vocabulary. So I'm not gonna go through all of the findings, I'm just gonna give you one example that was so poignant to me, which is that for example, 25 years ago, what you knew about your individual health, your, the way that you think maybe, like your personality, that stuff was basically um, someone's opinion. Uh, it's not someone's opinion now. For example, we know more about our individual selves, excuse me, we know more about our individual selves than any generation has ever known. So for example, raise your hand if you have done a 23andMe genetic test. Okay, so about 10 of us in the room. By the next year, this time, another 10 of you, and then in another year, you will never live life without taking genetic tests. One, it'll make you feel much better about telling people that you're gluten intolerant, because now, <laughs> now you'll have data rather than, rather than getting all the judgment. But also, it will change, it'll, it'll change how, I didn't know this was a comedy show. Uh, it'll change how you work out, when you work out, who you reproduce with. I mean, all these things that we used to kind of just guess at, uh, we now have scientific conclusions for. And so when we're getting this down to the individual level, this is fundamentally changing healthcare. You used to walk into a hospital and hope that the, the doctor seeing you could figure out all the things that were going on with you before they acted on it. There's a new hospital in town that doesn't look like a hospital. Go to the two largest shopping malls in Los Angeles and there's a storefront right next to your coffee shop called Forward Health. It looks like a Apple store and there's no medical equipment, nothing. And when you walk in, it, the, the voice of the business is, you deserve to know your own health. It's a shame that you have to use these third party labs that are so expensive and removed, or you gotta go see a doctor 30 days after you've had your issue. This organization says, no, your body is your own asset. You can assess it and measure it and use those me measurements to make decisions. So one key example that came out of the data was that the humans alive today know more about their individual selves, their psychological selves, their physiological selves than any human generation has ever known. And again, this is affecting our choices. So back to the map, if we're living in this incredible age, and one of the examples is that we now know more about our individual selves than any human has ever known, what else is happening? Well, marketers love to talk about generations. In fact, most of the monikers that are used to describe generations, like millennial, are made up by marketers. Marketers say, uh, hey business, you gotta spend more money on this new group of people. The marketer says, well, what is this group of people called? And they're like, oh, they're millennials. And to give you a sense of this, uh, a generation is a 25 to 30 year historical event, right? We had 
Uh, the people born during World War II was the silent generation. They were quiet and modest and lucky to be alive. And <laughs> really, I mean, they were, they were like, oh my God, all of their siblings were, were died in war, you know? Whereas then they had children and were happy to be alive. And so they had lots of babies and we named them baby boomers, right? After the baby boomers came my generation and they told us that we were Gen X. Anybody know why they called us Gen X? Well, they didn't have an answer. That's why they gave us a placeholder moniker. <laughs> Literally like algebra, like, oh, do not have variable, call it X. And we thought it was a sign of our rebellion or our self-expression, total nonsense. In fact, it's such nonsense that what did we call the next generation after that? Gen Y. <laughs> you know, and then we had, you know, Ernst & Young, EY, now claims to have the largest recruiting, uh, new population of employees than they've ever had in history. And EY is a big international organization. They claim that all of their new employees are Gen Z. And my only question back to them is, cool, what's the next round? Is that Gen Alpha Alpha? You know, like what, <laughs> what comes after this arbitrary sequence? That's how relative these boundaries were. They were basically like, well, in 1980, if we wanted to sell to someone, what data could we get? Well. We could figure out what year they were born based on certain things. Okay, fine, we're gonna market to them based on their age. And then the second thing that we did to them, we took another choice that they didn't make. We took their sexual organs at birth and how the hospital recorded their sexual organs and then for the rest of their lives we said, oh, because of that designation, this is how you're gonna buy. This is what you like to travel and do. Can you believe this? For most of contemporary history, we marketed to people based on two choices they didn't make. The year that they were born or their sexual organs at birth. And I have a sincere question for you. Are you the year that you were born? Is that who you are? Is everything that I should conclude about you based on something that really was out of your hands? So what the Google data reported was that if you're targeting an audience based on the year that they were born, you're actually insulting them. You're not marketing. There's no top of funnel here. You're actually putting them off. And then if you give them a double punch by saying, oh, and by the way, because of this designation, you must only eat these things or you must only wear these clothes, very good chance that they're closing that browser, ending that story, moving past you as an option. So the amazing conclusion from the research was, not only are we no longer bound by these arbitrary designations, but we as marketers have a new incredible opportunity to meet people where they're at. Like, I don't care how old you are, or I don't care what your sexual organs were at birth, I care what you're thinking about, how you socialize, what subjects are of interest to you, how do you engage? Those things are far more telling of our behavior. And that was amazing to us as we evaluated this because it basically said, yes, we're all being born into this incredible era and these things are happening to us. Wow, we are no longer you know, designated by these arbitrary boundaries. Maybe we can be a different kind of generation. All great stories will have like a flickering light of hope. And so in order to do that, we called this new generation that you and I are a part of the hero generation. It doesn't matter if you're older or younger or this sexuality or that sexuality, it's indifferent to that. We're people like you and I who believe that we can change the world. We believe that we were put here not to just work, not to just profit, but to also advance the planet. That concept is intentionally cheesy. Like all great stories, you're kind of like, what? <laughs> like the, the, thir the thing died and then it came back 30 days later, that's what happened? Okay, exactly. The reason why you have to do that is because if you only make a bold claim that can't be refuted, people will not believe it. You owe it in the story to have bad things happen. And so the way that you do that now is you take real market data that is causing challenges and you embed it within your story arc. So that's exactly what we did here. I'll just give you an example. For example, the Google research proved didn't matter if you grew up in uh, Middle East, Southeast Asia, Northern Europe, you pick there's a very good chance that you were raised playing a game. Now that game may be a board game or it may be an online game, but it didn't matter whether that was cricket or League of Legends. That game environment, again, whether it's a baseball field with all of those people interacting with you, all those referees, that scoring mechanism, all that stuff, or you were playing a video game, there are rules, there are competitors, there are other people it actually started to inform human behavior. So many people have been raised gaming now 
that whether it was offline or online, it's affecting our expectations. One of the examples that came out of this was that modern employers are trying to gamify the work environment. Why? Because you were raised playing soccer, all that stimulation, you turned 18, and then we put you at a desk. Don't move. No physicality, no socialization. You, don't even, you, know, you only know about the rules when you violate them. You know, that was how we kind of put people to work. And as all of us as modern employers know, that is just not how people want to work anymore. They want the freedom to make their own choices, to go to the candy jar, work in that room. And so the amazing outcome of this was that no matter what community Google studied globally, no matter you know, how new to the internet they were, all of them were raised gaming. We're, one key nugget that came out of being raised playing games, and again, I don't care if you played you know, water polo or Othello, all you did was lose over and over and over again, and that was the game. That was your learning experience. You had massive permissions to stumble over the answers, kick the ball in the wrong direction. That's why modern employees want permission to fail, right? Well, I want to fail fast. I want to fail often. Wow. Major challenge for brands. How do you participate in an ecosystem where even healthcare has to be gamified? One fun example from one of our clients, a company called ADP, a big payroll company. If you've ever had to do payroll, had to have employees do payroll, let me tell you, they hate it. They hate putting in their hours. It's burdensome and frustrating. So ADP makes us money when you put your timesheets in. So what did they spend the most amount of money ADP has ever spent money on in history doing last year? Gamifying payroll. <laughs> so like when you actually are putting in your time, it's like a game. You're getting little bloop, 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 bloop. You know, it's like Waze. <laughs> it's like Waze, you know, little bubbles, bloop, bloop, bloop. Okay, and what does that get people to do? Imagine if 5% more people do their payroll on time and you're the largest payroll processor in the world, okay? That's time consuming and expensive, but it is an incredible consideration if you want to survive in today's economy. Another key nugget that came out of this was that consumers no longer believe brands when they communicate. Honestly, 25 years ago, if a brand bought a big billboard on the side of a freeway and it said something, you believed it. You, you had no question, wow, that, I mean, isn't someone evaluating whether they're telling the truth or not? A big evidence of this is now, there's, so no, there's nobody auditing. That's why you can walk into any hotel and they all have a five-star Travelocity rating. Have you noticed this? <laughs> or your bank and my bank, which both suck, both have awards for best customer service. You see how far this has gone? Consumers are so empowered to question because they've been given a device to ask virtually any question. We no longer have to wonder. We've been given the wonder engine that basically says, you don't know nothing. And that's not a poorly stated phrase. That's actually the truth. There's nothing you don't know. Because if you want to know something, you could, right? So if a brand says, the best way to feed the child is this, 25 years ago, you listened. Now you're like, mm, I'm going to ask my people, I'm going to ask the interwebs, and I'm going to garner a conclusion on my own. So one key outcome of this Google research was that our audiences so do not believe brands these days that you have to default to be under question. You're going to be questioned, and so your answers have to meet them where they're questioning. You can see that that's time consuming and cost prohibitive. So what this landed on was not only is this our journey and are all these troubles universal, but there's an economic opportunity here because, for example, there's never been more humans. Those humans have ha never had more currency. There's never been more buyers, more transactions, more transactability. And so we're kind of living in an epic time, whether you're selling air flight or healthcare. And so what the Google research had ultimately done was figured out that there were four mechanisms that were enabling brands to survive and thrive in this incredible era. And we summarized them down even further to four super actionable items. I'm not gonna talk about all of them at length, but I'll start by just mentioning there was a painful truth that came out of the research. That no matter what you sold, I think it was like from candy bars to airplanes. If you're not there when the buyer is ready to buy, that's on you. You've all been there, right? You're ready to buy that new item. And you go through the portal, you get into the transaction, get in the shopping cart, and there's, it, they don't accept your pay payment mechanism. You're out, right? You, no allegiance to the brand. The exit cost is nil. 
So one of the key outputs was, even though the world population is buying in the process of purchasing less than 5% of the time, See how small amount of time that is? Less than 5% of the time. If you're not showing up in those search results, if you're not proactively marketing against those keywords that they use within their verticals, that's on you. And if you can't accept digital payments and can't participate in their digital portals, at the moment of transaction, you're the one getting in the way. But that's not the big learning, because again, that was only 5% of the time, no matter what market we evaluated. What was crazy was what took up the bulk of the research which proved that most of the time, whether you're sell the buyer is buying airplanes or a candy bar, they're in the midst of a self-proclaimed life experience called learning. That their words, not the researchers' words. When we ask consumers, again, procurement officers in big companies, what are you spending most of your time on, online doing? Their answer was, oh, I am learning. I, you know, how did all of us get out of work today? We didn't come for a free lunch and a beer. We, oh, we're learning, right? There's this, unbelie right? There's this unbelievable permission that comes with learning. And so what came out of this research was this concept of teach, don't sell. Like, in this market, what moves to the top of search engine results, what gets restoried, reposted, reshared, is the stuff that, as, as a buyer, as a decision maker, makes me feel more informed. And what was incredible about the learning insight was that you don't have to originate the learnings, meaning you don't have to like do original research and do original orations. You can simply be where the learning happens, and that in itself will give you the brand credit. So a good example of this is Home Depot, which is a big box store that carries nothing exclusive. Right? There's everything you can get at Home Depot you can get elsewhere. Cool. So what does Home Depot do? The most valuable piece of real estate at Home Depot has no permanent structures so that every day it can be moved aside and made into a classroom where all the materials and the teaching is free. How much do you think Google charged all of these leading executives to come to their international summit? Not only zero, but Google paid for their flights. Okay? You understand that just by being the venue where the audience is learning, you often get that, that educational imprint. But the stuff that tends to stick around is not only when you are the venue where learning happens, but you are absolutely originating the insights. You're teaching the market new ways to think about things. So back to the map, if we're living in the greatest age of social change yet, and we have been given this chance to change the world in ways that no generation before us has, you know, maybe we're the hero generation, we're going to have to confront all the things that are getting in the way of success in our era. But we recognize that there are data-driven mechanisms to not only get us there, but to actually win, to create life-impacting processes. So one thing that was so amazing about the research was it proved that we used to turn to our religions, our corporations, and our governments to figure out how we should best live our lives. Like we used to take you know, how to feed our children best. We used to listen to our government, which we now know was wrong three consecutive times. They told us to feed our children this way, then they completely turned the map upside down, and then they turned it on its side with a whole new mechanism. And we used to turn to our religious leaders, which no matter what your designation, our religious leaders are under review right now, okay? We used to turn to political leaders, and no matter what your political affiliation, we realize they're all under review right now. And so what amazingly has happened is the world consumer has said, forget those antiquated legacies that you remember the way that it was. We're gonna talk to the organizations who are there when we're ready, are teaching me how to be the best parent executive possible, are helping me explain myself and express myself, but the pinnacle outcome that accounted for 10% of the time was the brand is helping me live a better life, helping me stay connected to friends and family, helping me treat my children better, be a better physician, actual like lifestyle counsel. Uh, fun examples of this were like Tom's shoes, which, you know, whether they're, I mean, I, they make your feet smell. Like, I mean, let's just get through to the point. If you've got a pair of Tom's shoes, you know when you're hanging out with your peeps, you kick them off, but you put them over there because they, they get stinky, right? And not only do they get stinky, they're very inexpensive to make. It costs about a dollar to make a pair of Tom's shoes. And why does Tom's shoes sell you two pairs? So they can charge you $50. But they realize quite quickly that by simply telling you that they're going to give that pair away to someone in a far-flung land, you felt like that $50 was worth it. It was so worth it that Tom's Shoes has not only been acquired by one of the largest private equity firms in the world, 
where Adidas has not been acquired or ASICS has not been, you know, they're all still fighting their own way. Tom's Shoes is not called Tom's Shoes anymore. It's just called Tom's. And now they sell coffee and glasses and all these other things. And you recognize, are they experts at those things? Are they expert purveyors of coffee? No. They have focused their entire brand value on the lifestyle of the audience, and that's enabled them to win. They have absolutely won the battle and are the fastest growing shoe retailer in North America. So to conclude here, I want to point out that this is a really bad drawing of data that was extremely important but impossible to retain. Even if you were a lead executive at Google, selling to the world's most powerful executives, you couldn't communicate it. But by simply backing out and considering the human at the other end and realizing that by telling a, a dramatic story of influence, you can get them to believe in a whole generation of people, a mass population, and believe that they have the, the tools to deliver that value. Um, I think that the proof in this was they gave us one spot in, for 30 minutes in New York to share that whole journey. And since then, it has been toured all over the world and is still being committed to new nations and new markets on behalf of Google. Remember, content that no one could ingest and replicate, shared simply differently, designed for an international audience of human beings who want to be moved. And it created an impact that is still, still to this day being measured. So I'll end by suggesting, uh, per the words of Joseph Campbell, that the best way to do this, the best way to win in an international war of words is to tell your own story best. Your business and its people are the hero in the journey. And it's not about measurements or analyses or quantifications, because all of those things are hard to track, hard to interpret. Here in Los Angeles, do you know that Sprint, AT&T, and Verizon all claim the best mobile coverage? <laughs> Do you understand? We can't hear the measurements anymore. They, they don't make sense to us. And not only that, but a lot of the internet organizations we've been buying or advertising were lying to us about traffic. We're lying to us about impressions. So we now owe ourselves and our audiences a little responsibility. We owe it to them to show them whether you met us here or there, this entire experience is part of a continuum, a hero's journey worth remembering.